All right, guys, how you doing tonight, or today, or whatever time of day it might be for you? We are going to talk about the Spanish conquest of the Aztecs, 1519 to 1521, one of the great sort of world-altering events, definitely, one of the pivotal events in the history of, of human affairs over the last several thousand years. Um, and in order to start talking about this, we're going to start with Columbus, all right? If you grew up in the United States up to the 1950s, when you were about five or six years old, they taught you a little rhyme. They taught me a little rhyme, at least, but I'm an old dude, right? 50 years old here in 2017, and that rhyme went like this. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Great. Doesn't teach you a whole lot. Certainly nothing about motivation there. So, okay, why then did Columbus do this? You know, what was the point in Columbus sailing the ocean blue? You know, I mean, we need more than that, right? Well, Columbus had a big idea. And the idea was that he could get to the east, from the European point of view, east. What we now know as China, Japan, India, where there were tremendously lucrative trade opportunities much more quickly by sailing west across the Atlantic rather than by sailing east all the way around Africa or by traveling overland across Eurasia, which was a very long and arduous journey. Now, if you want to go Google it up, you can find out a lot more about what Columbus had going on, you know, sort of in his mind about he had a lot of big ideas in terms of why he wanted to get to the east and find a quicker way to get there. Columbus is a very complicated guy, okay? But he's really a very small part of our story, so I'm not going to get into all of that, all right? At any rate, Columbus was a fairly educated fellow. <clears throat> but like yours truly, math was not his strong suit, okay? His calculations of the circumference of the world were way off because he thought that the world was as big around as an orange, all right? I like a nice navel orange, you know, about, about this big. When in fact, it was really about as big around as a grapefruit. So his thinking was that when he sailed like this far west, he was going to run into China. Like from Spain, you go this far, you get to China. All right. But the problem was sailing that far around a grapefruit, he didn't get to China. He ran into something entirely new that nobody had ever heard of in Europe. That they, they didn't know anything about, okay, which was the Americas, the Western Hemisphere, these two continents, right, which the Europeans are going to end up calling the New World. You know, he had to go about that much far further, like, beyond the Americas, actually, to get to the east, right, across the whole Pacific Ocean, beyond the Americas. That's where China, Japan, and India was, okay? So he didn't know anything about this. After several months of sailing west, you know, he ran smack dab into this, like, brand new piece of real estate, you know. And actually the Norsemen, the Vikings, right, up in Scandinavia, you know, they actually knew a little bit about the Americas. They discovered it a few hundred years before Columbus, but then they got bored with it. That's a whole long other story that really doesn't intersect with our history at all. Again, Google, you can find out about it if you don't already know about it. Um... If you watch the interesting adaptation of Neil Gaiman's uh, magisterial fantasy novel, American Gods, they recently did an eight-hour version of it on the Stars Network. There was a little bit of uh, the discovery of the Americas by the Norsemen at the very beginning of that series, the first episode. It's actually the very first scene. But, you know, that's kind of a sidebar here. Anyway, the Norsemen knew about it. They'd actually discovered it, you know, before anybody else in Europe but only they knew that they'd done that, okay? So for all intents and purposes, in terms of the big picture, because everybody ended up finding out about it, it was Columbus that discovered the Americas from the point of view of Eurasia, of the old world. Of course, the people already living there, you know, in the new world, soon to be known as Indians, you know, they already knew that they were there. 
and they didn't think that they were being discovered. It, it, but this is all a matter of perception, right? When people say, Columbus didn't discover the Americas, you know, well, yeah, he did, from the point of view of the old world, just not from the point of view of the people already living in the new world, in the Americas. It's all about point of view or perception, right? Now, what you may know is that Columbus brought his plan for a quick route to the east by going west to nearly every monarch in Europe. He went to England, he went to Portugal, he went to Spain, he went to France, um, and everyone turned him down because of his bad math. The wise advisors to the kings and queens of Europe said, this guy's a knucklehead. You know, I mean, bad investment. You know, he's got a lot of passion, fire, good leadership capabilities, probably a capable seaman, but the plan is for the birds. Okay, I mean, it's pass, right? Okay, the myth that a lot of times, you know, little kids sort of learn when they're in first, second, or third grade, that only Columbus knew the world was round. Is That's what it is. It's a myth. It's a fairy tale, okay? Every educated person in Europe knew this. And what's more, they knew that Columbus was wrong in his insistence on an orange-sized planet. They knew it was bigger than that. Okay, everybody knew that, all right? But ultimately, Columbus went back to Spain, and he got the backing of Queen Isabella for a variety of reasons, which, again, we're not going to get into. And in 1492, off he sailed. Okay, now if you look here at the map, Happy day here, Spain, okay, and Columbus, 1492 to 93. Off he goes, okay, he ends up over here in the Caribbean, and he goes back. Okay, and I see Columbus again, and again, and in fact, there was another voyage. Columbus ultimately made four voyages before he was done, okay, but again, another story that we don't have time for, okay. He gets to the Caribbean, like I say. He makes a landfall on an island that he names Española, or later it becomes Hispaniola, which today is divided right smack dab down the middle into two little bitty nations, which we call Haiti and the Dominican Republic. He noodles around the area a bit, thinking that he's in the islands that he knows lie off the coasts of mainland Asia, and he ultimately heads back to Spain with some Indian slaves, three, and a quantity of gold dust, okay? Not gold chunks, you know, nuggets, whatever, but dust, okay, like sand, but it's gold, okay? To prove, A, that he found the way to Asia because the people prove that they're shorter than Europeans, darker of hair and skin, their eyes are dark, yep, these are Asians, okay? And B... There's great wealth there for the having. The gold dust is an indicator that there is gold there in larger quantities somewhere, okay? Because you don't get gold dust without there's larger deposits of actual gold somewhere because gold dust has come off of, it's disintegrated from larger quantities of solid, you know, thicker pieces of gold, right? So he's going, hey, clearly I found Asia and there's gold there, okay? Now the greed of the monarchs of Spain, the queen and the king, Ferdinand and Isabella, is totally fired by this, right? This is a happy day, okay? I mean, the gold is all they care about. And, of course, they set Columbus up for a second voyage, and then later a third and a fourth, but okay. More importantly, word of his voyage and his discoveries spreads, okay, throughout Spain and beyond Spain, throughout Europe, Okay, and within almost no time at all, other European seafaring powers of this age of history are going to start heading west on their own voyages of exploration to see what riches and advantages they can leverage for themselves over here on the other side of the Atlantic. So if you look at the map, guys, you can see Dutch voyages of exploration, the jolly good English, right, 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 and the French, eh? and then further Spanish <clears throat> Advo ad adventures <laughs> in seagoing exploration, right? So red, arrows, teal, blue, whatever color that is, brown, some medium brown, but you get the idea. 
Okay, we're not going to get all into this because this class is not about the seagoing adventures of uh, exploratory European fatheads back in the 1500s, but you just get the idea. Columbus kind of ignites this whole thing. All right, now, between 1492 and 1511, over the course of about 20 years, the Spanish discover, explore, and colonize La Española, or Hispaniola, which is today Haiti and the Dominican Republic, okay? Cuba, which looks weirdly like a vacuum cleaner, leaned way back down towards the floor, right here's the handle, and there's the engine, brrr, right, running it down the floor here, at least that's what I think, and Santiago Island, which today is known as Jamaica Man, right? Right, Bob Marley and etc. Peter Tosh and all those good cats, all that reggae, groovy reggae. Ugh, love it. Okay. In 1518, Francisco Hernandez de Cordoba heads off the map a bit over this way. Explores off just eh, go like another inch, inch and a half to the my left. Okay. And he explores along the coastline, then back onto the map around the perimeter of the Yucatan Peninsula, okay? And he and his guys, they find gold, for real gold, chunks of gold, items and objects of gold that have been created by the Indians. They fight the Maya Indians, okay, here and there. And they return back to Cuba just in time for Cordoba to die of his injuries, but not before he has compiled his report, which is there's lots of Indians there, and yes, indeed, they do have a fair amount of gold. There's clearly gold there, large amounts of it somewhere or other. Otherwise, they could not have created these groovy objects that we have brought back with us. What is the source of the gold? Where are the mines? You know, hey, we don't know, but it's out there somewhere. Okay, now, Cordoba's report is, you know, it's provocative, right? They've discovered that there's no gold that is natural to the islands. Okay, the Spanish have already concluded this. Whatever gold is to be found in the islands has come from the mainland. Okay, by searching around, consulting the Indians there, they figure this out. Okay, Cordoba is the first one to have found a significant amount of gold on the mainland. So he has not died in vain, but for the greater glory of Spain. You know, this is cold consolation, right? I mean, I'm sure he's not exactly thrilled about having died, you know. But okay, at least he got immortalized on a piece of Nicaraguan currency. You know, a, something, you know, better than I guess what most people get in the long run. But I'm sure he would have rather lived another 20, 30, 40, 50 years or something like that. But, at any rate, the man who received this report and was responsible for doing something about it was the viceroy or the governor of Cuba or Cuba, Diego de Velasquez. And he's got this right-hand man, a very fired up and ambitious young cat, always looking for opportunities to prove his worth by the name of Hernan Cortez. Okay, and Cortez, the viceroy determines, would be just the fellow to send off in charge of an expedition to the mainland to see exactly what was what in terms of the disposition of native populations, amounts of gold, and etc. Hang on, guys, it's really hot in my office, um, and I'm going to turn the fan on just like here. Yeah, that's going to help. Okay, so the governor sets Cortez up with a complement of three ships and the men needed to run this expedition, men for the ships, men for a military expedition along the coastline and possibly into the interior. And then the day before they're supposed to leave, the Viceroy cancels the expedition because seeing how fiercely and efficiently Cortez has taken charge of the whole thing, Velazquez begins to see in Cortez a possible rival who might end up outshining him in this venture. You know, like he'll discover something great and end up like maybe taking his job or something. And he decides, you know, I don't really need this kind of aggravation. You know, <laughs> maybe I'll just wait and find some guy that's not so potentially going to be successful, right, to take charge of this. So he decides to, be, to sort of decommission Cortez and says, no, I don't want you to go after all, okay? But Cortez has seen his moment, and he's not going to let it slip away. 
So that night, he decides to get the hell out of Dodge City, as they used to say, and seizing his destiny in his teeth, he summons his men and under cover of darkness takes the ships out of the harbor, defying the order of the governor. He leaves on the expedition anyway, deciding that he'll trust in fate to win the day for him and he'll deal with any consequences of his actions later. Like he's basically saying, look, I'm going to go out there and kick ass and take names and win something big and succeed so greatly that I'm just going to be forgiven for having disobeyed the governor's orders. Like, just I'm just going for it, okay? So, you know, big uh, cojones here, right, in terms of Cortez and his ambitions, okay? Now, here is an illustration, a drawing of Cortez by Jacques Reich from the 19th century after an earlier artist whose identity is unknown from the time of Cortez. So we have a pretty good sense that this, this illustration on the left is is fairly accurate in terms of, you know, this is kind of what Cortez looked like as a young guy. Okay, now the uh, the, the painting, the above right, um, was a painting also done uh, of Cortez when he was young. Again, pretty good sense that that's more or less what the cat looked like. The image in the middle uh, is a modern-day illustration from a video game, if I'm not mistaken. I found this just on the internet, and I thought it was just a cool kind of like, well, here's a, a pretty good sort of modern-day iteration of what Cortez might have looked like, full body with the sword and the whole nine yards. You get the idea, right? So here we are. Our, well, maybe not our hero. It depends on your perspective. But certainly our protagonist in the story that you're hearing and going to hear more of over the next 30 or 40 minutes or so. Okay, so what exactly does Cortez do? Well, they start out here at the island of Cozumel after having sailed off from Cuba over here. Okay, start out at the island of Cozumel and they head west around the peninsula. Okay, ultimately going off like so around the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, but before we head further west, I want to talk about who they discovered living near Cozumel on the mainland two shipwrecked Spanish sailors who had been living with the Maya for eight years, Gonzalo Guerrero and Geronimo de Aguilar. Okay, now, Aguilar is thrilled out of his mind to see the Spanish. Okay, it's like, you know, saved! And after eight long years, you know, dude can't wait to get some tapas and a cerveza. Okay, I mean, he's just like out of his mind. He can't believe it. Like, oh, God. Okay. Now, the problem is Guerrero lives with some other Maya, with, you know, another tribe, like 25, 30, 40 miles away, like dozens of miles away in the interior. So they have to send a runner, you know, a message to him. Okay to sort of say, hey, we're saved, you know, some Spaniards have arrived. Come on, we can get out of here. Okay, so they send this message off to him, and rather than getting him back, okay, they get this message back. Okay, and when they, they you know, the message that's in him is brief and to the point, you know, right? Like, we're rescued, let's split, get back our ASAP, or we're leaving without you. You know, you're amigo Jared, right? You know, <laughs> come on, man, okay? But, you know, it's been seven or eight years since the two men have seen one another. And the letter that comes back from Guerrero makes it clear. I've put down roots here, and I do not wish to leave. Okay? In fact, in his own words, he says, Brother Aguilar, I am a married man with three children, and they look at me here as a cacique, which is a chief, okay? and a captain in time of war. And then he goes on to say, I love my life. He talks about it at length. He talks about how he's gone native and has a pierced nose, ears, and a tattooed face. And he can't see how he would fit into society back in Cuba, let alone in Spain. Right? And then the very last thing he writes in the letter is this. He says, Ahora vea a mis hijos, que hermoso son. He says, now look at my children, how beautiful they are, right? Now it's obviously rhetorical because nobody's, they're not there to see the kids, but he's, but he's saying rhetorically, like, in, in my kids, they're so beautiful, right? Like, how can I leave my kids, you know? And here's this great statue, 
in Mexico City or this this collection of statues, this this piece of art, you know, of Guerrero and his wife and his kids, you know, sort of like symbolically kind of representing them as like the first, you know, sort of mestizo family in Mexican history, right? You know, I guess they were. Really, you know, the first Spaniard to, to have an actual family to settle down and marry an Indian, have kids and, you know, really kind of a powerful thing here. Here's this, you know, this illustration of like, maybe this was what Guerrero looks like. And then he, he gets a little long haired and shaggy. And then here he is with the nose piercing, the ears stretched out with the lobes, the tattooed face, and, you know, the hair pulled back and a ponytail top knot, you know, he's, he's gone native. It's like, yeah, this guy's going to go back to Cuba and be accepted by polite colonial Spanish society or back to Spain. Like, it's impossible, right? Now, clearly, Aguilar had not gone native. He was still a Spaniard living with the Maya. But Guerrero, you know, had sort of given up on any kind of sense that, like, I'm ever going back. And he just embraced this new life and found something that he loved there, right? Well, at any rate, Cortez and his expedition now have a translator. And Aguilar, they have a man who can speak to the Maya and relay everything back to Cortez, you know, perfectly, or pretty damn near perfectly. Every Maya, you know, there, there are many different Mayan, let's say, dialects, right? I mean, the Maya can all communicate with each other pretty well, even though it's not one overall Mayan language all the way through this entire region and even off the map down into here. But they can still make sense of one another, okay? So Aguilar is pretty much, you know, an ace in the hole for Cortez to communicate with any people that they meet going all the way down and off into this region, basically, right? So this is an invaluable advantage, but it's going to get even better. Because when they arrive in the present-day state of Tobasco, which is down here, Cortez ends up purchasing a slave who originally came from this region, okay, up here. Okay, so she can speak Nahuatl, the language of that area, right, the language of the Aztecs. But since she was sold as a slave down here, she can speak the language of the Maya, okay? So she can speak to Aguilar, who can then communicate with Cortez, who now has a chain of understanding and translation with which to deal with the Aztecs, okay? And this slave's name is Malanali. Okay, now Malanali, or Malintzin, or Malinche, or Doña Marina. This woman is one of the most significant individuals in Mexican history, and is the first female figure of historical significance in the history of Mexico that is not a goddess. Purchased as a slave, as I said, she becomes Cortez's translator lover, concubine, and mistress. She bears his children and becomes his wife later. A complicated figure, at once a great hero and a betrayer. She was born Malanali, but became known to the Aztecs once she arrives with Cortez. And not just to the Aztecs, but to the Indians, other Indian peoples as well. She becomes known as Malinsin, with the Tzin suffix appended to her name as an honorific to denote her status as Cortez's woman and later wife. Tzin is, is like a way of saying, you know, um, honored lady, okay? So Malinali, Malin Tzin, okay? Um, later, to the Spanish, she was Doña Marina, Marina, being the Christian name that she chose for herself when she was baptized. Now, Malinche, this was the name that was given to her later, much later, in the early 1800s, centuries after her death, after Mexican independence from Spain, when sentiments of nationalism branded Malinche a traitor, and more specifically a race traitor, and her honorific... <coughs> 
of Jin was stripped from her name to replaced by the Che of Malinche and Huai. This is a mystery lost amidst the shifting sands of time. What that suffix of Che really denotes, no one really knows. I mean, no one really knows. I've researched this. I've consulted with very informed Mexicans. Um, nobody knows. She became the Malinche, La Malinche, wife of Cortez, the ultimate Spaniard, right? Cortez, okay, the conquistador, and as I said, a race traitor. But a traitor to which race? Certainly not to the Indians. For at the time of the conquest, there was no conception of Indians. There was just every distinct people. Aztec, Mixtec, Totonac, Zapotec, Tarascan, Tlaxcalan, Otome, hundreds more. They did not think of all of themselves together as some sort of common group with a name and a racial identity that could be betrayed by one of their own to some other racial group. There was no racial consciousness in the way that it exists now, guys, in the 21st century. We live in a very different world 500 years later with a very different way of seeing such things. So what race could Malinali have betrayed from the point of view of 19th century Mexicans when they gave her this name, Malinche? Well, yeah. The Indians, because that's the way that Mexicans saw it. It wasn't the Indians in the 1800s that started calling her Malinche. Mexicans started calling her Malinche. Okay? Educated Mexicans, nationalistic Mexicans who had won their independence from Spain. That's the way they saw it then, and that's the way many of them still see it 200 years later. So let's try to analyze this. She was sold into slavery as a child and taken many hundreds of miles away to another part of the world. She returned many years later as the lover and powerful companion of a man who was poised to potentially become the conqueror of those who sold her into slavery. She helps him to defeat the Aztec Empire and become master of that empire. Who was she betraying and by what set of moral guidelines? You can't impose a modern moral or ethical value system on a figure who died centuries in the past. Who did she betray? No one, if you ask me. But her name has been conjugated into a term, melinchismo, which refers to women who can't be trusted or to anyone in Mexico, male or female, who are too familiar with or who seek to impress foreigners. It's almost like an Uncle Tom in the United States, right? If you're a black person, you know, they call you an Uncle Tom. Or if you're a Mexican, you're a Tio Taco, a sellout. Somebody who tries to impress white people, sucks up to white people, cares more about white people than their own people. And again, if you ask me, this is a fate that her memory simply it, it does not deserve. It's a very unfair perversion of her memory and her identity. Deeply unfair, in my opinion. But it's up for you to decide, really. Everybody has to formulate their own opinion on this, if you care to. Here are some images, some idealized, probably, images of Malan Ali, a painting by the great legendary Mexican painter Jorge Gonzalez Camarena, 1979. All right, Cortez has his crew, check. He's got a girlfriend, check. Always good on a long journey, right? He's got his ambition firmly in check, check. And as they make their way further rest along the Gulf Coast, they finally arrive at a particular spot, which is Sempoala, or Zempoala. Sometimes you see it with a Z. Sometimes you see it just depends on the way the translators want to treat it. And this is right where the major Mexican city of Veracruz is located today. Actually, Cortez is going to establish Veracruz as a little 
because it barely is a town to begin with. But anyway, he is he establishes Veracruz or Sempoales. Okay, this is where the story really starts to get good. This is where maybe the greatest listen to what I'm saying. The greatest coincidence in history ever in the entire history of mankind takes place. Because before they can really even start their normal sort of, hey, you know, do you have any gold around here? You know, shtick with the natives. The Indians have all fallen on their faces. I mean, they're like groveling in obeisance, okay? They're treating Cortez and his men, like there's some sort of big deal. There's a lot of singing and chanting and wailing and pulling of hair and like, you know, tearing of their faces. I mean, no one knows what's going on until, of course, Malinelli swings into action and Aguilar begins to translate. And hey, wow, I mean, here's the deal. The Indians believe that Cortez is a god and that everyone with him are supernatural beings possessed of magical powers. I mean, not not Malinali, okay? Not her, but the Spaniards, all right? Cortez and all the Spaniards, supernatural beings possessed of magical powers, Cortez a god. So why jump to these conclusions? None of the other Indians thus far encountered had such wild notions. So why did these Indians think such a thing? Well, they happen to be inheritors of a certain belief system wherein some centuries back, a great god king, one Quetzalcoatl by name, went into exile to the east, the land of the rising sun. Remember this, guys, from an earlier lecture? And when he split, he issued a prophecy in which he said, I will return in the year one read, and when I come back, I will return to find the king or reclaim my throne. The prophecy is a little vague on come to find the king, come to get my throne. Okay, but now here comes dude, Cortez, from the land of the rising sun, from the east, right? From the water, across the water, out of the east, okay? In what the Indians described as floating islands, that's what they called the ships. Remember, the Indians, the biggest watercraft they have are canoes that hold like 16, 20 guys. Okay? And the Spanish were in these gigantic ships that can carry like 150, 200 men that rise up 25 feet out of the water. Okay? Floating islands that are, that are covered with clouds. That's what the Indians think the sails are. They see them off in the distance, these big white things. They think they're floating islands with clouds following them, okay? The Spaniards have magical powers. What else do they, do they call these guns? The Spaniards shoot off a gun. It sounds like thunder and lightning. The Indians all fall on their faces on the beach and they're shaking uncontrollably. They're, about, they're literally, I mean, look, I don't want to be gross, but let me talk like we're sitting in a bar together. They're, they're crapping themselves, okay? I mean, they're literally like voiding their bowels. This is what the Spanish said. They're literally, they can't control their, 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 their waste products. They're just that terrified. They think the gods have come among them and are bringing down thunder and lightning. They thought a gun like this was loud. What do you think happens when the Spanish bring a cannon down on the beach and blow off a cannonball? Okay. What do they think of the dogs, big mastiffs that are drooling, constantly drooling with the tongue and these big sharp teeth walking around pacing and looking at the Indians. <laughs> right. I mean, what do the Indians think of a dog? The Indians have chihuahuas, right? Okay. And they're looking at these mastiffs, for God's sakes. And then the horses. There's nothing like a horse here. The steel armor and the swords. All of this, it's magic, okay? And the story about Quetzalcoatl is that he had pale skin and light-colored hair and a beard, okay? Well, Cortez actually had dark hair, but not as dark, even though those images earlier make him look pretty dark-haired, not as dark as the Indians, okay? So now there's that, okay? So here it is, he, and he's looking, he's asking about gold, Okay, and gold is what the Aztecs have, so that's like he's asking for the king, like the prophecy. And wait for it, this is the year one read. 
Okay? That's the prophecy. He's supposed to arrive in this year, and this is the year. Okay? I mean, in the words of the mighty Shaquille O'Neal back in the year 2000 when the Lakers won their first championship, can you dig it? Okay? Now, I'm going to go way more into this prophecy later on in class in another lecture, so for now, let's just leave that there. But the chances of this happening, guys, were <laughs> extremely slim. Okay? Not just that Cortez would look right and have godlike powers, but to arrive in the year one read, the Aztecs and the Indians in this part of the world used a calendar with 52 named years. So this could only have happened in one out of a 52-year cycle. If it was last year, uh-uh. Next year, nope. Only in this year would the Indians be predisposed predisposed to believe that he is a god. And by believing that, Cortez was afforded a tremendous advantage because he's not going to be perceived as a threat, as a foreign invader, an enemy, but as the returned god. And after all, how can that be a bad thing, right? Now, let's look back for a minute here. This is a famous mural by Diego Rivera, the legend of of Quetzalcoatl, okay? And you see here, all of the Indians thronged around Quetzalcoatl, and then behind him, the mountain ranges with divine portents and omens, right? A volcano erupting with some sort of a, hang on now, okay, some sort of a supernatural beast, a dragon perhaps, maybe the serpent Quetzalcoatl erupting or coming from out of the volcano, okay, the sun upside down in the sky, some sort of celestial boat traveling across the sky, and I'm not entirely sure what this signifies. If I wish I knew, if I did, I would certainly tell you, but you're getting the idea. Here's a detail where you see the light-skinned and bearded Quetzalcoatl, the, the, the god king figure Topilson who, who turned himself into this he was a king turned himself into this god king Quetzalcoatl anyway getting the idea here right okay fantastic stuff by Rivera now Cortez has made it very clear the Spaniards are here for gold and lots of it okay the Indians tell them that the Aztecs have a lot of gold but their capital Tenochtitlan is a city of gold that the buildings are filigreed in gold, okay, decorated with gold. There's gold everywhere. And in this news, the Spanish are like, you know, giddy with happiness. I mean, they're dancing jigs, okay. The Indians, they don't understand this because they don't have money. There's no concept of money in the Americas, okay, or a system of exchange based on one, you know, like main valuable commodity, it doesn't work the way it works in the old world. They just haven't evolved a system um, of economic exchange that's anything like the early form of capitalism that exists in the 1500s in Eurasia. Okay, They engage in trade of all manner of things, but it's a barter economy, right? And the medium of exchange is based in Europe primarily on specie meaning coined money, and primarily gold. There's also silver and some bronze, copper money as well, okay? And there's other things that are, that are worth money that change hands, and you know, but it's primarily based on gold. Okay, Cortez tells them, we Spaniards suffer from a disease of the heart, which only gold can cure, okay, right? We need gold for medicine to help us with this disease we have, right? Well, okay, think the Indians. You know, maybe that makes a kind of sense. Because to them, gold is, quite literally, the excrement of the gods. Okay? God shit. Literally. It shines with the power of the sun. Which means that it fell from somewhere near the sun in the sky. Which is where the gods, or, or most of them, live. Some of them live under the earth, but most of them live in the sky, near the sun. Um... The Indians believe that the gods expel their waste products, which fall to the earth below, 
and thus gold has sun power, god power in it. Thus, it's magical, it's sacred. And so the Indians use it to adorn sacred objects, buildings, to make sacred and powerful items, you know, statues and jewelry and things, okay? Sure, why wouldn't it be able to heal heart disease? After all, it's got God power, sun power. Okay, fine, you know, I mean, I'm sure they can dig it, all right? Now, it's August of 1519 when when they set out from Zempawala, which Cortez has established as the town of Veracruz. And they head up this. I oh, see here it's with a Z. You see it? Zempawala. Okay. And they head up this, the only road from the coast into the interior. Okay. And every step of the way they're climbing. Okay. Here's the coast. Here's Tenochtitlan. Okay. The Lake of Mexico in the Valley of Mexico. This is about 5,000 feet above sea level. All right. I've driven this and you're, it's flat land for a little while here, 30, 40 miles. And then from about, from about here up, you're almost consistently going up, 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 up. I mean, you know, you level out for five or 10 miles, but you're basically climbing all the way into the interior. The darker areas on the map here or mountain ranges between here and about let me look hang on and about here it's jungle okay like I mean like rainforest if you guys ever see the movie Apocalypto the Mel Gibson film it was it was filmed in here Okay, you know, you looked at that, you probably thought it was like down in Central America, Brazil, or something like that. I was like, no, it's right down here on the coast of Mexico, in the state of Veracruz. Okay, but anyway, they're, they're, they're constantly moving up, climbing every step of the way, basically. Um, you know, a lot of jungle-choked mountains, and as they march, they arrive in the territories of the Indian peoples that Cortez opened communications with earlier, all these different communities in these different territories, okay? And they start to firm up alliances. These are all societies that are under some degree of control by the Aztecs, and they're sick of it. Cortez has runners sent with messages to neighboring Indian peoples further out in the distance, asking that they send emissaries to come and meet with him, and also to the Tlatuani, or emperor of the Aztecs, Montezuma, right? And while he receives ambassadors from these various societies, from the Aztec emperor, all he gets is crickets. No real communication. Okay, so after about, no, you know what, in part because I just made a mistake. I should have, <laughs> I should have read this part down here before that part up there. I, I reversed them. Okay, but it's not the end of the world. Let me just, just bear with me. Okay, so we haven't actually left yet. I'm sorry, I just dropped the ball here. Okay, so we're still back here at the coast. After about six weeks, Cortez says, all right, time's up, we're going. And he readies his men for a march into the interior to Tenochtitlan, the city of gold. But before they leave, the very night before, he has his most trusted men row out to the ships and blow holes in their bottoms with explosives and sink them. This is called scuttling a ship. There's a typo there. So the guys wake up that morning and they see that their way home has been totally eliminated. Why does Cortez do this? Can they build ships later to get back to Cuba? Sure, they definitely can do this, okay? But he doesn't want any easy way out. Cortez doesn't want any mutiny, any second thoughts. From this moment, he wants his guys to have only one thought on their mind. Forward into victory. There is no retreat, no going back, no chickening out. They're going to beat the Aztecs, win the ultimate prize, or they're going to die in the attempt. Okay, and if you look at this image back here, this is a painting. Okay, a, not from the scene, from the moment, from right there when it happened, but it's an image of Cortez having scuttled the ships, ships sinking out here, and his guys on the shore are like, oh, you know, not some tremendous, you know, piece of, you know, art in terms of, like, execution, but 
still part of the history, so there you go. Okay, now back over here, yeah, they're marching into the interior, and Cortez is reaching out to all of these Indian people. Sorry about my goof there, okay. Cortez is telling these various peoples, look, stick with me, and I'll get these Aztecs off of your back for good. Two of these peoples in particular will become essential for Cortez and his vision of conquest, the Otomi, and most importantly, the Tlaxcalans, or the Tlaxcalteca. Okay, now more on them later. Then they arrive at Cholula, and Cholula is very interesting, not just then, but now, and for a number of reasons. At Cholula, you have the largest pyramid in the world, okay? After the conquest, the Spanish are determined to destroy, totally eradicate, every last physical reminder of the old religion, beliefs, the old ways. But the only way to do that with, with giant stone buildings is with gunpowder, right? In other words, you got to blow these suckers up, okay? But the Pyramid of Cholula is so massive that they realize they simply can't blow it up. It's just too gigantic, and they cannot get enough gunpowder to get the job done. So instead, they decide to bury it. They have Indians haul in hundreds of tons of earth, and they just cover it, okay, and pack down the earth. And then at the top, the colonial government, they built a church, okay? So... Look, there's like this giant structure, all right, that gets covered with earth. Then they built a church on top of it. What you see here is a scale model of the site with cutaway views to give you a sense of what lies beneath that hill, of what it was that got covered up, all right. In the 20th century, the Mexican government got interested in excavating the pyramid, and that's where the scale model comes from, the archaeological investigations of the last century or so. Okay, here's the church up there. Okay, if you look at all this, okay, like here's a dude right here. Okay, now if you look at all this, you're over here. Look, no, you're over here looking up there. Whoops. Okay, so this guy's standing like right over here. Hello? <laughs> okay, and you're looking up here like this. So you can see how far away the church is, all right? The Great Pyramid in Egypt is taller than this, but not by much, okay? But in terms of when I say that the Great Pyramid at Cholula is bigger, what I'm talking about is the amount of stone that it contains, okay? The amount of stone used to build it. It's far, far larger than any freaking thing in Egypt and anything else in Mesoamerica. It's the most massive. It has the most mass. Okay, It's the most massive pyramid in the world. Okay, this over here, if you look at this side view of this staircase, right, here's people climbing up or going down. And here you can see off of the street, you know, like, the, the, obviously, you know, like, the... the the, the complex is completely surrounded now by the town of Cholula. It's grown up around it. I mean, it was a town at the time, okay? But now, of course, it's, you know, like a modern community. But anyway, that staircase is this right here, okay? So, like, I'm here, and I'm taking this picture off here, and then over here is, like, the street that you can see. So look at this staircase, and then you get a sense of that right there. Okay, and here's a picture from the gates of the church up here, looking off in this direction. And this is looking off over one part of the town of Cholula to the volcanoes. On the other side of this range of mountains is Mexico City, or Tenochtitlan, right, where the capital of the Aztecs was, which is Mexico City today. These are the volcanoes of Popocatapetl and the Iztacihuatl. All right, and then... Here's something, okay, if, you, if you're looking, you know, I, I enlarged this and kept it, tried to get as big as I could and as crisp as I could, you know, without it getting too, like, pixelated and grainy. Okay, here's a church, here's a church, this is a church, that's a church, that's a church, that's a church, 
This is a church. I got to put only one on here. Okay, and you can't see, but that you could, if, if you could tell, you can see like 10 more churches in the distance. The story is that you can go to a different church every single day of the year in Cholula, that there's more churches in Cholula than any other town in Latin America. And it's not a really big city at all. It's not like L.A. or anything like that. It's like got a population of like maybe three or 400,000 people. Like it's ridiculous. Like when you're standing up on that church at the top of the of the pyramid, which is the highest spot in Cholula. I don't think there's a building in Cholula that's more than like four or five, six stories high, maybe six stories, something like that, maybe. Um, you look in any given direction and you can see like 15, 20 churches off in the distance, 25 maybe. It's just, it's like crazy. You know, there's no, no real story behind why there's so many churches, but it's just, it's just like unbelievable how many churches you can see in like every freaking direction from the top of that and from the top of the, you know, the from the church up there. And again, can you go to a different one every single day? Is there 360 churches in Cholula? I'm not entirely sure, but there's an awful lot of them. Okay, anyway, now, from Cholula, which you can see right here, okay? Dolan, Chololan, or Cholula, okay? Right over the mountains. Popocatapetl, Iztahibatl, right? There's the view. Tenochtitlan, from Cholula to Tenochtitlan is about 100 miles, like the distance for those of you that live local from LA to Santa Barbara. Okay, Cortez sends another message to Montezuma and gets stonewalled again, no response. So he replies, or not, or I'm sorry, he doesn't get no response, but he gets kind of a you know, we're a little busy right now, repainting the living room and redecorating. So, you know, just uh, hang on and we'll get back to you sometime soon. How about next year? You know, like it's this very sort of like, uh, like prevaricating and trying to sort of like hold him off. Okay. So Cortez writes back saying, look, I'll be there soon. And he decides to take some time to really firm up his system of alliances, particularly with the Tlaxcalans. Now notice here, Tlaxcala. Okay, on the other side of the mountains here, from the Valley of Mexico, it's a largish area, right? Okay, so he decides to really bond with those guys because they're big and powerful, and we're going to get to them more in a minute, all with an eye towards building an army of Indian allies with which he can defeat the Aztecs, who, he's been told, have a very formidable military. Okay, he ends up residing in Cholula, for about two months. And there comes a day when Cortez announces to the Cholulans that he wishes for them to gather together in the Zocalo, or the public square, at the center of the, of the city. Okay, And once they're there, having had all of his cannons placed at strategic spots around the perimeter of the Zocalo, he has his men begin blasting or firing into the throng of unarmed civilians. Then his cavalry and infantry charge in, and with their steel swords, they begin to hack, slash, and murder at will, killing as many people as they can. The story in every historical source is that thousands died in the massacre at Cholula. The end result of this is that seeing the Spanish willingness to destroy innocent people for whatever reason and the power of their weaponry, the Indian allies become more committed than ever to the cause of Cortez. But would Cortez have murdered thousands of innocents simply to firm up his alliances? Hatched a plan just to serve this end? Well, no, it doesn't seem likely. I mean, there's, in other words, there's nothing in the story up to this point, to show Cortez as some bloodthirsty barbarian capable of these kind of atrocities. This doesn't really square up. Okay? There is a story from the sources of the time to explain Cortez's actions that goes like this. The Aztec emperor knew that soon Cortez would be leaving Cholula by the western road, 
okay? In other words, following the same road you'd already been following, headed towards the Valley of Mexico. And that the emperor had sent an army of men to lay an ambush for Cortes and his forces. Some of these Aztecs, these warriors, hiding down the Western Road, had snuck away from this secret camp and gone into Cholula for drink or women, you know, like at night, 10 o'clock at night, yeah, sneak into the, you know, the town and have a few drinks and find some girls and whatever, and then sneak back and nobody will know we were gone. And, you know, in Cholula, they won't know who we are and whatever, just a bunch of guys out on the town, right? Okay. But somehow word of what they were doing had leaked out. They get drunk, they talk to the girls that they're with and whatever. Okay, maybe. Some people knew about it. One of the people that found out was an old woman who had been assigned as a maid to Malinsen, and she told her of the plot against Cortez as she did not want her to be killed. Then Malinsen, of course, told Cortez. The captain, angered, decided that this could only have been planned with the assistance of the Cholulans. He didn't think that the Aztecs could have known <clears throat> when the Spanish were going to leave unless the Cholulans were in on the whole thing. And so he decided to punish them as an object lesson of what would happen to anyone that crossed him. That this lesson ended up firming up his alliances was just a stroke of good luck on his part. Some have theorized that there was never any Aztec ambush at all. Okay, that, that, that the whole thing was a big story that Malinson made up, that she fabricated it to set the massacre in motion. Maybe she even suggested that to Cortez, knowing that it would help to strengthen the alliances for Cortez. But as this is a more recent train of speculation by historians, I see this as an example of the blaming of La Malinche for anything for which she can be blamed. I don't really place that much weight in that. I, I don't really buy that. Okay. But one other thing that does need mentioning is this. If there were Aztecs waiting outside of the city to ambush the Spanish, they were long gone when Cortez and his allies left several days later. Okay, in other words, there was no ambush. But let's say they were really there. Let's say that the plot was real. Okay, well guess what happened to them? The massacre went down. And off in the distance, a mile or two miles away, those Aztec warriors heard a sound unlike anything they had ever heard or even imagined. Now, you might be thinking, a mile or two miles away, how could they hear anything? As you have to remember, remember that they live in a world that's incredibly quiet. There's no noise. There's certainly no noise pollution. But guys, there's no cars. There's no radio, stereos, jet planes flying overhead. They live in a quiet world. Okay, so off in the distance, over a couple of hills or whatever, what they heard was the sound of thousands of people being killed, hacked to death, with steel swords, stabbed with daggers, and preceding that, the sound of cannon fire and regular firearms, all of which were as, as loud as the thunder. Okay, as loud as volcanoes erupting off in the distance. Popocatapetl and his Takiwatl. Okay. What was the story that these tough Aztec warriors had heard? Some clown says he's the return god Quetzalcoatl and we're supposed to kill him and all the guys that he's with for the emperor. And then what do they hear off in the distance at Cholula? What sounds like, I don't know, the wrath of the gods? being visited upon the people of the city, and maybe it's coming for them next. I mean, these guys were tough, but I'd bet my bottom dollar that at that point, those hard-as-nails Aztec warriors decided that the mission was a bust 
turned towards home and ran like the devil was at their heels, man. And when they got back to Tenochtitlan, their, cap their captain went to the Tlatuani or the emperor and told him, Yes, it's true, O emperor. It is Quetzalcoatl. And he brings with him the thunder and the lightning. And we both saw and heard it as it destroyed the entire city of Cholula and all its people. Yeah, I know. They saw nothing. No lightning. And yeah, they didn't see a thing. But look, they turned and ran, disobeyed direct orders. So they got to sell this story to the emperor, right? So what are they going to do? You know, they're going to sell the story so they don't look bad, you know. And they're going to they're gonna tell them what, what's going to work, right? Yeah. So oh, we'll never really know what actually happened to Cholula, except that there was a massacre. But how did it go down? Why did it go down? What were the motives? How was Malinsin you know, involved? We're never going to really know, okay? But what we do know is that as a result of that massacre, the binding up of Cortez and his Spaniards with their Indian allies was firmed up like, I mean, like, like you know, like nobody's business, right? His next stop was Tlaxcala, okay, where he, where he really cemented these connections with the Tlaxcalans, who are going to be his most essential and most important allies. I mean, muy importante. In the, in the city hall at Tlaxcala today is the biggest mural in all of Mexico in terms of, of length. It covers the whole interior of the city hall. It's it's like 500 feet long, okay? And this muralist, Desiderio Hernandez Xochitlotzin, he worked on this mural for a half century. It's the whole history of Tlaxcala, the region of Tlaxcala, like before men even arrived there, like starting with just the animals and the plant life, all the way through the arrival of the first Indians and, and the beginnings of their society, culture, and civilization. I mean, it, all the way up through and into the time of the conquest and then beyond and in, into the modern era. It's just unbelievable, okay? And this detail, and this right here, this is like kind of 15 feet high and 18, 20 feet wide, but this detail from that mural is, uh, you know, just one piece of it showing the meeting of the king of the Tlaxcalans and some of the primary nobles with Cortez, you know, and you can see here with Malinsin right in the middle, okay, and you know, the priest back here and Cortez's primary lieutenants and probably Pedro de Alvarado right here because he's so damn tall. You'll hear more about him later, but anyway, I get the idea, right? Okay, so let's continue, okay? Now, Agua for me. A little more about the Tlaxcalans, because you've got to understand their central importance and what is coming. Tlaxcala was a sovereign kingdom that existed within the Aztec Empire. Okay? In other words, when the Aztecs were expanding, they sort of bumped up against the territory of the Tlaxcalans, and they went to war. Ultimately, they realized that, yes, they could beat the Tlaxcalans, but the cost would be so enormous that it would be better to just arrange a treaty whereby Tlaxcala could exist under its own king within the empire and the Aztecs would not have to deal with a tough and almost certainly problematically rebellious and barely conquered people living within the empire and awfully close to the capital. Okay, This ended up working out well all around just turned out to be the best solution, you know, uh, for both both the, them and the Tlaxcalans, okay? And in fact, just to give you a sense of the Tlaxcalan status within the empire, only about 30 years earlier, a Tlaxcalan warrior named Tlaxcuicole had been invited to act as general of the Aztec forces who were going on campaign against the Purupecha to the north, another very tough kingdom. 
Okay? Now, Tlahuicole reluctantly accepted, saying he'd really rather just stay in Tlaxcala and fight for his own people if there was fighting that needed to be done. You know, but, okay, so he's, you know, you know, you want to stay on the Aztec's good side, so for the good of his people, he says, okay, I'll do it. So he was unable to defeat the Puropecha because, like the Tlaxcalans, you know, like I said, they, they were tough, and they were not going to go down easily. Upon his return to Tenochtitlan, he chose to go home to Tlaxcala, but the Aztecs were angered that he would not remain as their general regardless of his recent defeat. I mean, like, their attitude was, okay, so you didn't win this one, but we want you to stick around. And he was like, well, you know, I appreciate the offer, but I really want to go home. So they were sort of snubbed, and they felt insulted, and they sentenced him to death. Tlahuicole demanded to be allowed to die like a warrior. So they tied him by the ankle on top of a great sacrificial stone, and they gave him a ceremonial death by combat. And there he faced and killed eight warriors and disabled a further 20. Okay? Now that, my friends, is what you call macho. Okay? The Tlash Collins were serious badasses, and that's why they were able to maintain that position of sovereignty within the Aztec Empire. If you look back here, there's a painting where you can see the combat stone, the Tlahuicole is tied to by this rope here. They have him tied tied by the waist. Okay, this is another detail from that mural by Shoshiti Otsin. Okay, but at any rate, you see him fighting up here, you know, in front of this assemblage of Aztecs, right? He's defeating this eagle warrior, and you get the idea, right? Okay, then here's another an old painting by an artist. I don't know the identity of, but this is another painting of the trial of Tlahuicole. Okay. And then here's an image from the Florentine Codex. Okay, this was done by a long story short by, by Aztec historians after the Spanish conquest under the guidance of Spanish priests. Okay, as they tried to create a kind of encyclopedia of Aztec history. Um, you know, while there were still like guys alive, the new everything that had happened to the Aztecs in their history, their culture, and et cetera, and so on. They were trying to preserve it. So they created these things called the codices, these encyclopedias. Um, this was the Florentine Codex. And so you see Tlahuicole, right, tied by the ankle to the stone, and there he is with his sword and his shield, and kind of getting ready to fight this jaguar warrior, right? And then here, this is in Tlaxcala, actually. There's a statue. We call it, it's about like 15 feet high. And then these people at this, at this uh, little like mini mart over here, they told us that he used to have a sword, the statue is made of bronze. And, the, and then for, I don't understand this, like they couldn't explain it, they don't know why. But the, the blade of the sword was made of wood. And then like it rotted or it broke off or something like, I just can't for life and figure out why they did it like that. But anyway, whatever. You still have this awesome statue of Tlahuicole, right? You know, like the main dude in Tlaxcalan history, but you get the idea. Okay, now, at the end of November 1519, Cortez and his army finally arrive at Tenochtitlan, having crossed the mountains into the Valley of Mexico. The meeting of Cortez and Montezuma is one of, and arguably, the most significant meetings between two individuals in world history, symbolizing, as it does, the real beginning of the great drama that is about to unfold. The conquest of the Kingdom of Gold, the Aztec Empire, by the Spanish, which in turn will set into motion the large-scale colonization of the Americas and irrevocably transform the history of mankind. Really, guys, it's that big. And probably not really for the better. All things considered, when you get right down to it, okay? Um, there's a, an image from an unknown codex. I don't know which one this is, but we have Cortez, and Melencin, and Montezuma. Another image with all these, you know, 
divine portents and omens of the sky, obviously not looking too happy about it. Right? Um, let's consider the personality of Montekazuma quickly before we break um, for part two of the lecture. Why would Montekazuma allow the Spanish to enter the city? Why not have them camp on the shores of the lake? They were, after all, an entirely unknown quantity who, by all reports, had slaughtered thousands at Cholula. Maybe destroyed the city. Might they not do the same in Tenochtitlan? They clearly possessed some sort of magical powers that could not be controlled or, or predicted. Was it simply that Montezuma could not afford to lose face in front of his people, look like a coward? That would appear to be the easy answer, but it does not take into consideration the character of the Tlatoani. And one more time, if I was not clear earlier, Tlatoani is emperor in Nahuatl. Okay? Montezuma was a ruler who loved the cosmic and spiritual, the supernatural, in religious, unearthly forces were like mother's milk to him. He was a mystical, churchy sort of guy who enjoyed the company of holy men, enjoyed talking over the mysteries of the universe with them. He, several years prior to the arrival of the Spanish, a deeply influential Aztec philosopher and scientist, Nezahualpili, came to him and said that wise men of his acquaintance had predicted that soon there would be foreign domination of the empire. Montezuma challenged him to a ball game. They're, they had a version of a game that was almost like soccer. I'm sure you probably know about this, the ball game of Mesoamerica. So Montezuma challenges him to a ball game, like, how dare you, I challenge you. Okay, and then in losing the game, he saw this as a sign that Nezahualpili was almost certainly correct in his warning. He took that as an omen. Between that time and the Spanish arrival, there were several celestial events that were always seen as divine omens. A large number of shooting stars and an eclipse, as well as much seismic activity, a few earthquakes, volcanic eruption, that sort of thing. All of this preyed upon the mind of Montecazoma, who you see here, observing, you know, a, a shooting star, a, a meteorite, uh, or a comet, you know, one or the other, it's hard to say, you know, in the nighttime sky. And so when he first receives word of the return of the god Quetzalcoatl at the coast, he's freaked out. But remember, the prophecy is vague. Is the god going to come back to, to look for the throne, to strike at the king, well, the Tlatoani really doesn't know what to make of any of it, but what he does know, I think, based on his personality, is that now that the god is here, he, the emperor, is bound by history, prophecy, and the weight of divine expectancy to bring these beings in and treat them with the same hospitality due to any distinguished foreign visitors at minimum. And, ironically, this invitation in to Tenochtitlan, into the palace, is what will set the stage for his own death and for the doom of the Aztec Empire. Okay, guys, that's the end of part one. I'll see you for part two. Uh, hello. There we go.